Oh, <laughs> uh, my uh, pleasure. I, I really appreciate you having me in your home. Um, let's 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 start with uh, why I came here today. I, I saw an article in the paper about uh, you going back to Iwo Jima for the 70th anniversary. Had you been back before, or was this the first time for you? This was the first time. Um, I had uh, previously. I had several opportunities to go. The first uh, ceremony that they had on Iwo Jima after World War II was the 40th anniversary. And uh, some people that were, uh, well, a general that was actually on Iwo Jima during the time, he was a captain at that time, but, but uh, he wanted to organize a, uh, an anniversary celebration. So he, he got with the Japanese people and uh, they agreed to have this, uh, well, back up a moment. I'm getting, getting ahead of myself. The 40th anniversary was organized by the Marine Corps because we still owned the island at I that wasn't time. I aware of that. We, we do or we, do, we don't now? We do not now. But at the 40th anniversary, we did. So the Commandant of the Marine Corps and a group of other people decided they would have a 40th anniversary celebration, and I was invited to attend that celebration. <clears throat> and, but I couldn't go at that time because I was in the hospital. I'd had a, I worked with horses for 35 years, and I stove myself up and ended up in the hospital. So uh, I couldn't go. But... Uh, they asked me if one of the other Medal of Honor recipients could go, would I recommend somebody to go? And a fellow by the name of Jacqueline Lucas. Jack was on Iwo Jima, and his story is quite a story, and I won't go into that, but uh, Jack was the youngest person to receive the Medal of Honor since the Civil War. He was only 17 years old the day that the medal was awarded to him on the White House lawn, and Jack and I received it the same day. So that's how we became acquainted. And so I recommended that they contact Jack and see if he would go, because they did want a uh, Medal of Honor recipient who had received the medal from Iwo Jima. So Jack did. Jack went with the, for the 40th anniversary. Then we came up to the 50th anniversary, and they decided to do this every 10 years. What was the year of the 40th, just so I'm accurate? Do you remember that? Uh, I, mean, I, can, can... I, I can't tell you, <laughs> but if we go from 1945 to whatever, 40 years and... Uh, 1985, I guess. I, it would have been in, in that period, yeah. that's right, because I was in horses at that point in time, and I started in 1970, so... Uh, it would have probably it would have been in the 80s, but uh, then they came up to the 50th anniversary, and I was invited again. But by that time, they had returned the island to uh, to the Japanese, and they were in charge of it and in control of it. And I just made up my mind that I wasn't, I just wasn't going to go back again because I personally didn't agree with giving it back. I felt that we should have kept it, made it into a, uh, into a place where thousands and thousands of people would visit over the years, something like Hawaii, <laughs> that, that type thing. Or so, Normandy, maybe. Yeah. yeah. So I just decided I wasn't going to go back and, uh, and live with that all the, all the many years with lots of opportunities on, you know, at the 60th anniversary, I was again invited and I said, no, I'm not, I'm not going. And even in between, they would have tours there by tourist people that would go at other times and I was invited to some of those and I just, just didn't feel like I wanted to go. But uh, finally my grandsons, I have five grandsons and uh, two of them are right active in whatever I'm doing. So they kind of talked me into going back on the 70th. 
And finally I said, okay, I'll go. Uh, and, uh, what was that like for you? Uh, there were some uh, emotional times, but there were also some very rewarding times because I, did, I had my grandsons with me. I took two grandsons and a great-grandson with me. So that was motivation to go, sure. since they could go with us. Sure. But it, uh, it was nothing like I expected, really. The island 70 years ago was completely stripped of anything green uh, because we had bombed the thing for 30, uh, 130 days before we ever got to Iwo Jima to go on the island. So there was nothing standing, and now it's all green. Mm -hmm. The grass is green, the trees are green, they're not very high, but, but it's green, which kind of uh, eliminates the contour of the ground. You, I thought maybe I could recognize where I had been but I couldn't because the trees are all over it and you can't see the ground, you can't make out anything. I couldn't. So you had no point of reference at all. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That's interesting. And uh, I was uh, coming, the reason for that article, by the way, about the flag that I took back, I was coming through the uh, Orlando airport I'd been to Orlando and I was flying back out to come home and a fellow that was head of security met me at the curb site and uh, introduced himself and said his father was a Marine and he was on Iwo Jima. His father was. And uh, he uh, wanted to ask me a favor. So we got through the airport and waiting for a, my plane to come in and he pulled out this Japanese flag out of a little bag and and he said his daddy brought that flag back with him uh, from Iwo Jima and uh, that he indicated that he did not want the flag destroyed and he had been trying to find some place to put that flag like a museum or uh, uh, someplace on a military base. And he had not been able to find any place that was particularly interested in it because it had no particular history value, I guess. Only personal value to him. Yeah. So uh, he asked me if I knew some place that he could put the flag. Well, it so happened that when I came back from uh, Iwo Jima, I brought a flag home with me. But I'd really gotten the flag on Guam. When we took Guam back, uh, all Japanese soldiers carried a personal flag. A little different than, than our flag values. But they had a personal flag that people would sign for them when they were going into the military and kind of a greetings thing or a good luck thing or, you know, be careful thing, whatever, whatever they would put on there, they'd sign their name. And uh, so each Japanese soldier carried that, usually wrapped around his waist under his clothing. It was his personal flag. And they were good souvenirs, you know, souvenir hunters. So... Uh, uh, I'd killed an, an officer on Guam, and he had a saber and a flag. Uh, all officers carried a saber in the Japanese Army. And uh, so I took those as souvenirs and uh, put the flag in my, in my pack on my back and uh, carried the saber for a few days, but it was always in my way, and finally, uh, I sent it back to supply with my name on it so that they would keep it until the campaign was over and then I was to get it back again. Well, <clears throat> somebody wanted it worse than I did because I never got my saber back again, but I kept the flag and I brought it home with me. Uh, 
I've often wondered why. Why did I really do that? And other than it being a souvenir, it had no particular meaning. But uh, I kept it around the house for several years, and and my wife would every once in a while say to me, you need to do something with that flag. And so finally uh, I decided I would give it to the Culture Center in Charleston. And I asked them if they were interested in it, and they were. But I had to write up a history of where it came from, how I got it, and that type thing. And so I gave it to them and uh, forgot about it. That's almost 30 years ago. But uh, when I was talking to this guy at the Orlando airport, uh, I was saying, I was telling him that I had given my flag to the cultural center and maybe they would take his, but we'd have to have some history about it. And I said, uh, I'll contact them. And he said, well, take it with you and see if they will take it. And if they will, then we'll do, do the rest of whatever needs to be done. Right. Well, uh, my grandson Brent was standing just a little ways from me and he said, well, Papa, we're going back to Japan. This is November last year. We're going back to, uh, to uh, I mean, we're going to Iwo in March. Why don't you take the flag back with you and give it back to them? Maybe they can find a relative of that person. Okay, good idea. So I brought it home with me, and the guy that gave it to me was, was agreeable with that. So uh, I, I found a box to put it in and took it back with me. My plan was to give it to the ambassador of Japan because he was supposed to be at Iwo while we were there, along with our ambassador, uh, President Kennedy's daughter. Uh, she was supposed to be there. And uh, I, I heard while we were there that she had received some threat on her life or something and had to cancel her appearance and consequently, he canceled his also, so he didn't come either. <clears throat> but uh, after I got to Iwo Jima, I had noticed on Guam, while we were getting ready to go fly up to Iwo, we had one Japanese person in the group in a wheelchair. And I could tell that he was old. And, uh, but I didn't know why he was along. He was the only one with us. He was with your group. With our group, and I had no idea why. <clears throat> well, after I got to Iwo, I learned that the reason he was with us was that he was captured as a prisoner of war on Iwo 70 years before, and uh, that he was in such physical shape that and he didn't have any any weapons or anything of that nature so uh, our people got him put him in pow camp and treated him and fed him and got him restored to some form of health and then when the war was over sent him back to japan and i was told that that uh, he's sort of a an outcast because he he didn't do what all the other uh, Japanese people who were uh, subject to being captured did. Uh, they felt that being captured was a terrible disgrace, so they wouldn't give up. They wouldn't surrender. <clears throat> and uh, that made him kind of an outcast because he didn't follow the routine that they really believed in. But uh, after I got there and the ambassadors didn't show up, <clears throat> and I found out why he was there, I thought, well, I'm gonna give that flag to him and let him take it back home. Uh, <clears throat> so I did, I presented the flag to him and uh, through an interpreter, asked him if he might be able to find a relative of that flag and return the flag to that family. And he uh, took the flag out of the box and kind of checked the names on it and made the statement through his interpreter, these are old Japanese, which meant that when they signed it, 
they were adults, and that's 70 years ago, so naturally they would be very old people. And he doubted that he'd be able to find any relatives of those, but he'd try. And if he couldn't, then he'd put it in the uh, Kyoto Shrine, if that's said properly, he'd put it in a shrine where it would be kept. So we all agreed to that, and he took it with him. And I just forgot, forgot it. I'm done. I did my part, you know. But uh, a few weeks after I got home, uh, I got an email from uh, one of the Americans that was accompanying him in Japan. Now, how they hooked up, I have no idea. But anyway, he sent me an email saying that they had really found a relative and that they were up in northern Japan, and he was going to deliver that flag to them. And that if I wanted to, I could come over and join them and go with him to make that presentation. Uh, I elected not to do that, but uh, uh, they did. And I got some photographs that uh, uh, showed that the flag was delivered, and I have no idea what the relationship of the person was to the, the person who was killed. I, I don't know that. But anyway, they did send me four or five photos where they presented in the home. And so uh, we lived up to what we planned to do, and sure. it, it worked out. What a great story. Absolutely. What, what, how did that make you feel when you? Oh, absolutely. I, I just couldn't imagine the emotion that must have taken place in that family to have something that, you know, many of them, they never even found them. They're still trying on Iwo Jima through uh, DNA to identify their loss. And uh, probably those folk had no idea whatever happened to that individual. And to receive that personal flag back must have been very emotional. That's a great story. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, now, you, you mentioned you were on Guam yes. prior to Iwa. Yes. And I know the story, your story from Iwa, but I don't think a lot of people know how. Talk about your, your path to Iwa. I mean, were you, did you fight at, on Guam? And, and yes. Uh, I got overseas in December of 40, uh, 1943, and I arrived on the island of Guadalcanal that we had taken in 1942. But I was, uh, I was assigned as a replacement to fill in where we had lost Marines, uh, to fill in those vacant slots. and. And I arrived at Guadalcanal while the Marines that I was joining were at Bougainville. They were still fighting the Battle of Bougainville when I arrived overseas. And uh, we were to go join them, help them on Bougainville. But How old were you, excuse me? I was, uh, let's see, I would have been 20, I would have been 21. I was 21 in October of uh, 43, so I, would, I guess I would have been 21 years old at that point. I was t 22 when I finally got out a year later, so yeah. <clears throat> and uh, that's where I was assigned the job of a flamethrower operator because we got the flamethrowers for the first time while we were on Guadalcanal. We'd never seen them before, and it was a new weapon, and so they just said, you, you, and you, you guys are going to be flamethrowers, okay. So before that, you were uh, just an infantry? <laughs> just an infantry rifleman, yeah, absolutely. I was, I was what we called a BAR man, a Browning Automatic Rifle person, in a squad, so I carried a BAR prior to prior to that, and then when I was selected to be a flamethrower operator, uh, I moved out of that slot and they put somebody else in my slot, and we became a flamethrower operator. Right. 
we were trained both flamethrower and demolition so that we could either blow up something or burn up something, but we had to, we had to learn how to do both. And, and we were called a special weapons unit. I was talking to Kenny yesterday and we were, honestly, I don't know, you will know, what is in those tanks? Is it gasoline? Yes, yes. Uh, when we got the flamethrowers, uh, we had a manual with it, of course, to tell you how to take it apart, put it together, the part numbers and part names and all that. But there were no real instructions of how you utilize it, how do you operate it. It did, uh, it did have with it at that time uh, a uh, stuff that we called uh, um, phosphorus gel. It was a lot like our napalm, only it was more sticky and thicker than napalm, but it was uh, a powder that we would mix with gasoline that would turn it into this gel, and it had phosphorus in it, the powder did, so that if you got it on you and tried to spread it, you just make it worse because the phosphorus, you just spread the phosphorus more, and uh, it would stick to whatever it hit. It was like jello, <laughs> a little worse than jello. It wouldn't run. Once it hit, it stuck. And that's the first stuff that we had. And we were mixing it with uh, regular uh, 82 octane gasoline that we used in Jeeps and trucks and all that stuff. But uh, I had a gunnery sergeant that uh, once we experimented with that stuff of trying to get it on target, 20 yards or 30 yards away, uh, you only had four and a half gallons of it. The flamethrower with the fuel loaded weighed 70 pounds. And if you just opened it up and let it go like you would a water hose, uh, it would last for about 72 seconds. Not very long. Not very long. And uh, you couldn't aim it like a rifle. You couldn't get it up here and aim it, so you had to shoot from the hip. And by the time you found your target, well, you're out of fuel. Yeah. So he didn't like stuff at all. And he began experimenting with different fuels. Uh, we, we experimented with uh, kerosene and gasoline and motor oil and gasoline and diesel fuel and gasoline and... and uh, we wondered about what if it would explode on your back? You know, if bullet penetrated, would it explode? Yeah. Well, there was some doubt. Of course, we didn't know. So we set it out in the field and shot at it with M1 rifles and 30 caliber machine guns and tried to penetrate it, tried to make the thing explode. We never could. The bullet, the metal was so thick it wouldn't penetrate it. The bullet would ricochet off, and it was only, you know, so big around, so you really couldn't get a solid hit on it. Uh, the rubber hose, or the, the hose that ran from the tank to the gun that released the fuel, uh, we could cut that hose into with weapon, you know, make it useless, but, but it wouldn't catch on fire because the fire end, the thing that causes it to flame, is clear out on the end of the gun. Right. So, uh, you'd lose all your fuel, but uh, yeah. you, it wouldn't blow up. We tried it. But uh, finally, uh, through experimentation, uh, he came in one day, uh, and a, he had access to a Jeep. We little PFCs and privates and corporals, we didn't have any access to Jeeps, but he did. He came in with uh, a 55-gallon drum of high-octane, 130-octane gasoline that they use in airplanes. And uh, his idea was that it would burn with a lot more heat than 82-octane gasoline. So uh, we began mixing that stuff with diesel fuel. <clears throat> And we, we experimented a lot with it. Uh, the, one of the disadvantages of it was that 
that if you fired it into the air, like 10 or 12 feet off of the ground, it wouldn't go anywhere. It hit the air and spread out and burn, but it wouldn't, you couldn't get any distance out of it. So he came up with the idea that uh, rather than sh shoot it like a rifle, uh, shoot it on the ground with about three, two, three second bursts, and it would turn into a huge ball and roll that flame, that ball, into a cave or into a pillbox. And it worked. And yeah. that was the method that we used. And so. The distance, how, how, what was your, what was your average distance with them? Uh, uh, of course, it naturally would depend on your territory that you're in at the moment. But uh, 25, 30 yards would be max. And often you couldn't get that much out of it. but. Uh, that would be max of rolling it on the ground just and have it not burn up before it got there right. yeah um, so you fought on did you use it on Guam did you we we had flamethrowers on Guam but Guam was almost totally jungle so we didn't use the flamethrower uh, I assume and this is an assumption on my part uh, Guam is an awful lot of coral rock and they couldn't apparently dig caves under underground uh, at least we never encountered any in the section that I was in we'd have to sometimes cut our ways through the jungle with a machete or whatever to get through but never encountered any caves or any pillboxes on Guam so we never had any purpose of using the flamethrower and although when we hit the beach, I had a flamethrower. I took, I, I, you know, had a flamethrower with me, but it just so happened we never had to, had to use them. And, but that all changed on Iwo. Yes, Iwo, the, the guy in charge of Iwo uh, had you know, something like 19 miles of tunnels running under that place. And uh, uh, the history says he had 800 pillboxes on that little place. So they were just stuck everywhere, you know. Uh, caves, lots of caves, because they would, uh, they would come up out of the tunnels through the ground and just have a hole, but uh, they could come up to the surface, shoot at you and then go back in the hole and you didn't even know where they were, where it came from, you know. But, uh, uh, so flamethrowers were used a lot on Iwo, absolutely. T um, talk a little bit about your your recollections of being there. I mean, I I can't imagine. I, I can't imagine. I mean, you you. I've watched documentaries. I've read. That pales in comparison to being there. Um, talk about your. What you can recall about going on Iwo that in that that time there? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we were a reserve division. There were two Marine divisions. They had forty thousand people between those two divisions. About twenty thousand in each one. So, uh, on the way to Iwo, when we were aboard ship, uh, they briefed us of uh, where we were going, because they just sure didn't tell us before we left Guam. We had no idea when we got aboard ship where we were headed. <clears throat> but they told us uh, they had a board that had the diagram of what Iwo was shaped like. You know. And uh, they told us how wide it was and how long it was and that sort of thing. But that we were reserved and we probably would never even get off ship because they, the island being so small, you know, two and a half wide, two and a half miles wide, five miles long. We just finished Guam, where uh, I think it was 16 miles from one coastline to the other coastline. Say so, uh, they just didn't never dream that they would have to have the number of Marines they finally needed. So we probably never get off ship, and uh, that would probably go on about five days, and then. We'll go back to Guam. They anticipated that thing would only last three to five days. 
that they would take that island in three to five days. It took them 36. But <clears throat> we had no intelligence on the island. Uh, the only intelligence that we had were the frogmen had gone in and checked around the shoreline to make sure there were no, no bombs or mines or anything like that going in. But so far as what was on the island, uh, we had no idea that they had 23,000 people in, on the island or that they had all these tunnels or all these pillboxes. The pillboxes were covered with sand on top mostly, so you really couldn't tell it was a pillbox because you, from the air, it just looked like more sand. You know? But <clears throat> uh, was it? In, was it? Forgive me because I don't know, but it, was it uninhabited except for the Japanese soldiers? Did yeah, okay. that's all. Yeah, they uh, they had brought them there. Uh, along with some laborers. Uh, they, the guy that was in charge of that island had been educated in some of our universities in the United States. Hmm. So apparently he knew eventually we were going to have to go by that island or take that island or do something with it because uh, they put him there and in uh, early 1944, I believe it was, and he began building all these pillboxes and digging the caves and that sort of thing in preparation that we were going to come. And he reversed the trend that we had had before when we attacked an island like Bougainville or Guadalcanal or uh, New Caledonia, any of those, uh, <clears throat> the Japanese would set up their defenses to keep you from being able to get on the island. If you couldn't get on the island, you couldn't capture them. You couldn't capture the island. <clears throat> and that was their defense. So they would try to eliminate as many Marines as they could before they got there on shore. But this guy reversed that. He said, don't do that. Let them come ashore let them come on because once they get here they can't get off there's no way you can get back on boats and go back to your ship again so you're 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 there to stay so he uh the the first day or the first part most of the first day he just let them come on you know so and you uh, had, had no idea that I mean, was there some resistance? I mean, you had oh yeah, yeah, yeah there there was some. Uh, there were uh, National Marines being killed on shore, but they weren't using uh, their heavy uh, ammunition, heavy mortars, or or uh, artillery and that type thing until I think the record says something like there were. 30,000 Marines on that island before they really opened up to yeah. to take care of the of the Marines that were there and the beach uh, the beach line that we had from Mount Suribachi up to the up to the uh, corner or the turn in the island was probably a mile, might have been a mile, and so there were, when you put that many people in one spot, it's, it's very difficult to miss. And so we were sitting away out in the ocean. We could hear the explosions, but we couldn't see anything that was going on. And uh, everything was, uh, all ships were blacked out. You, you had no lights at all. You weren't supposed to. You couldn't even light a cigarette up on deck. If you smoked, you had to go down inside. And uh, so the first day, we could hear what was going on. And occasionally, a fighter plane would go sailing across us, you know, because they're going over and attack the island. And uh, we could we could see those one of those every once in a while. 
but uh, we had no idea what was going on. But the second day, so in fact, the night of the first day, they told us, you are going in tomorrow. And uh, so they they got us up, and <laughs> they always feed you steak and eggs just before you go in combat. And I've always wondered about that. How come they do that? Yeah. But <clears throat> we, ate, <laughs> we ate chow about 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the morning, and then got off ship at daylight. And uh, in fact, it was before daylight. Got in the Higgins boats and went out circling, uh, ready to go ashore. And we, uh, we circled all day because the Marines ashore could not take enough ground to let us come in behind them. There was no place to go. So uh, we circled all day and then went back board ship again that night. <laughs> wow. Well, I think maybe we might have been the only outfit in the history of the Marine Corps that got two egg and steak breakfasts. Because next morning we got steak and eggs again. Yeah, that's pretty good. But uh, then the next day, we got in about noon. They had finally taken enough, out, enough of the ground to permit us to come in, and uh, we became the spearhead of the, of the unit. Our job was to go up the center of the island, and the other two divisions were to take the shorelines. <clears throat> and uh, so we had to cross the airfield. That was straight in front of us. And of course, there was no protection on an airfield. The shell craters where they had bombed the thing and dropped the artillery on it, there were some holes that you could run from one hole to another hole. And sometimes you'd have five or six or eight people in the same hole because it didn't make any difference if it was full, you're still gonna to try to get in there with them to protect yourself. But uh, we lost a tremendous number of, of Marines get, just getting across the airfield. And uh, it was probably, the airfield was probably, uh, as, I, as my mind remembers, uh, 200 yards, something like that, across the airfield and, and the level places beside it. You know. But once we got across the airfield, that's where we ran into the reinforced concrete pillboxes. And uh, this guy had built them out of concrete, and he had put what today we call rebar. Back in those days, you just called it iron rods or something. But he had put a lot of those in the concrete so that you couldn't blow it up. It was just... A uh, you've seen some pictures of it where the concrete was given, blown away from the rods, but the rods are still sticking in there. And uh, so dropping bombs on it or hitting it with artillery or bazookas didn't do anything for it, you know. So flamethrowers became the principal weapon to eliminate a pillbox. Uh, every pillbox had an aperture on the front of it that was about six to eight inches wide, uh, clear across the front, so that those inside could have a field of fire out here. They could they could see out that aperture, and you know see 300 yards from here to there because they had nothing restricting them. And we approaching the only target we had was that aperture. If you're going to sh hit something, you've got to shoot through that aperture. Yeah, you got to put your bazooka through that hole, say, or machine gun or whatever you're using. And uh, so flamethrowers became the principal weapon to eliminate those inside those pillboxes. How many, and, how many on average, do you know, were, were in those pillboxes? Did they hold? It would depend on size. They weren't all the same size. Some were smaller, some were larger. Uh, I was told, and I have no way of verifying or even confirming or, and it, it's very difficult for me to imagine one of the pillboxes, one of the seven pillboxes that I eliminated that day, I was told later, after we got back to Guam, that somebody had counted 17 of them in that pillbox. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. I never looked. That that wasn't my job. My my job was 
get the flame in them and go on about my business. But uh, when I hit the beach, uh, I was a corporal, and I had uh, six individuals, privates, and PFCs that were in my special weapons unit. We had, as I said, we had a gunnery sergeant in charge of our unit. <clears throat> he was a boss, but uh, my job was to uh, uh, supervise the six and make sure that they had everything they needed to do their job, whether it was flamethrowers or basting caps or prime accord or whatever it was, I make sure that that was available. And uh, so when we hit the beach, uh, two of them were designated to go with each of the companies. We had A, B, and C companies in the battalion. So uh, I put two of them with each company. And <clears throat> they were riflemen. They, they were riflemen when they weren't carrying flamethrowers. And the only time they carried flamethrower is when the platoon commander or the company commander or the gunnery sergeant said, we need a flamethrower to burn this cave out or blow this pillbox up or whatever. Then they would get the stuff to do it with. Because you didn't carry 70 pound around on your back all the time, you know. <clears throat> so uh, by, uh, that was on the, the 21st of February, we got, we got ashore. And on the 23rd, two days later, still trying to break through, we'd gotten across the airfield, and now we're trying to break through this group of pillboxes that were, we called them self-protecting because they built them kind of in pods of three so that one of the three could see anybody trying to get to it. Yeah. All yeah. yeah. And... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, we ran into those, and we would, we tried to break through those, and every time we did, we would just lose Marines because they had all the advantage. When we'd jump up to run from one place to another to advance, well, we became a target. So and no cover. Had no cover. That's exactly right. So uh, the commanding officer, he had lost, he had lost all of his officers except two, and most of the squad leaders had. They'd been killed or wounded. Uh, the guys that were with me, uh, all of those had been either killed or wounded, so we didn't have any left. And my commanding officer, who, uh, who was a captain, uh, he was still, still around, so he called for a meeting of uh, whatever NCOs he had left. We, NCO is a non-commissioned officer. And I didn't even qualify for that as a corporal. I'm not a commissioned officer. I'm just, just a corporal. But I was told by my first sergeant that I needed to go to that meeting. And, of course, I did. So we gathered in a huge shell crater, uh, probably a bomb that had been dropped there. And, and it was big enough that, that uh, 10 or 12 of us could get in that hole and get down below ground level so that grazing fire couldn't get us. Didn't do much for mortars and artillery, but uh, we didn't get into that while we were there anyway. But uh, we got in that hole, and naturally he's trying to figure out how, what are we going to do with this thing, you know? How are we going to get through the pillbox? Our job was to keep going, move forward. And <clears throat> so that's where he asked me if I thought I might be able to do something with a flamethrower. And uh, I have no, I've never known what I, what I said. <clears throat> Somebody later said, after we got back to Guam and they did interviews with the people, uh, they said that my remark was, I'll try. And so he gave me four Marines. You had to have been, I mean, it, it, it was your job. That was my job. Obviously, but yeah. there, I mean, I'm trying to put myself there with, I, I can't imagine being, being there and there the, you see what's going on around you Yeah. and what? you get the call, you're the guy who's going to go, what, what was, what was that like? Well, 
you know, uh, I can't remember giving it any particular thought at that moment. Uh, he gave me four Marines, two BAR people, and two rifle people. Uh, one of those BAR guys still living. He went back to Iwo with us. And he's one of the guys that was shooting at the pillboxes while I'm trying to get to it. And he lives out in Winona, Minnesota. And, uh, but uh, during that afternoon of four hours, those guys would, they would have to move when I moved and picked a different pillbox, they would have to move themselves and in order to shoot at the pillbox while I'm trying to get to it. So two of those guys got killed somehow in the process that afternoon. And uh, I never knew who they were. They were just Marines. We were, we were so mixed up because we had lost so many people that the formation or the group that you were in, you may not have anybody left. You just join whatever group is around, you know. And uh, so I never did know. I didn't even know Lefty Lee, that's his name that lives in uh, Winona. I didn't even know he was a B.A.R. man until 15 years ago I read it in the newspaper. I didn't know that, you know. We had just never contacted each other. Or I didn't know to contact him. But I didn't know he was one of those that was doing that. So, uh, so the strategy, just so I'm clear, and I'm, I'm trying to, I try to think like the viewer a little bit. <laughs> okay. So understand this: the Marines who were with you cover fire, shoot, so they'll. Yeah. So the people in the box will will drop uh, drop down. Right. So you can get in. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you can. If you can kill them as they're trying to shoot at you through that little aperture, okay. You know, he's not going to shoot at you anymore if you get him. And, and and he has to have his head in a position where he can use a rifle. Well, nine times out of ten, if you get him, he's he's gone. He's not coming back again, you know. But uh, there's many things about that afternoon that I, absolutely escaped me, always have. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that's bothered me all my life, well, ever since then, how did I get the flamethrowers? Now, you six, how did I get them? I don't remember. I am reasonably sure in my own mind and from talking to others after we got back to Guam, nobody ever said, hey, wait out there, I'll bring you one, you know. Right. <laughs> Once you use up a flamethrower, uh, either the fuel is all gone or the air that propels it is all gone or the match in the front of the nozzle that sets your flame on or sets your fuel on fire, once those are expended and you have none left, that flamethrower is useless. So it had quick connects on it. It had one around your chest, one around your stomach, and you just quick connects. You just pull it and it's loose. Uh, we just pull it and roll out of it. Leave it there. It's, it's useless, you know. So, but how did, I, how did I go back to my headquarters? And I have no idea what yardage I'm talking about. I really do, don't know. But how did I go back and pick up a new flamethrower and come back again and do that five more times after the first one? I can remember the first one. I remember going with the first flamethrower on my back to a shell crater to actually get in the shell crater with a guy by the name of Schlager. I have no idea what his first name was. But a guy by the name of Schlager, that would be my pole charge man. <clears throat> Usually that's never even mentioned. A pole ch we made pole charges before we ever left Guadalcanal. And we took an eight foot piece of board, usually a two by two, and we put a 12 inch wooden plate on the front of it, nailed it on there. And then we would take uh, eight blocks of composition C2, which is almost like a putty, 
and uh, we would tie that on, wrap that on that plate with a fuse then, uh, uh, that, a fuse lighter that went all the way back to your, to your hand and uh, we would, the job of the pole man was that once we burned a cave out or burned a pillbox out, his job was to run in and stick that thing in the cave or in the pillbox through the aperture and blow it up so it couldn't be used again. You know, couldn't be reoccupied. That was his job. But the pole guy that went with me, Slagger, we got in that first shell crater and worked out what we were going to do. I can remember our talking, here's what we're going to do. And of course, I'm, I'm the operator, so he's got to do what I, he was only a PFC anyway. <laughs> but uh, anyway, he's supposed to follow me so that when I burn the pill box out, he runs in and with the pole charge. You know. And we came up out of that shell crater and I had, I had told him, stay on your belly, crawl. Yeah, you can't run very fast with 70 pounds on your back and you make a good target when you're, your body plus the big tanks on your back, you know. So, you know, crawl up out of the thing and we're gonna crawl toward this pillbox. Well, for whatever reason, whether it was fear or fright or forgot or what, but as we came up out of the shell crater, he stood up and a bullet hit him right smack dab in the center of the helmet penetrated the helmet and then hit the liner inside, which was fiberglass, and went around the helmet to the back of the helmet. And when it did, it was coming in kind of like this. And uh, naturally, it just jerked him around and he ended up back of the hole. And I thought he was, you know, I thought he was killed. And so I crawled back in the hole to see, see if he was dead. And uh, when I got down there, uh, got down there with him, his eyeballs were still working. <laughs> he was all, all uh, uh, disoriented, that type thing. Uh, but uh, he was done. He was done. He, he, he couldn't. Yeah. He couldn't follow me from that point. Uh, he took the, he took the helmet home with him. That was, that was his souvenir, <laughs> you know, cause, but uh, <clears throat> uh, so then I went to work by myself. I didn't have a pole charge man on any of them after that. Just didn't, there was nobody available. So, uh, so there's many things about the day. I, I, I don't remember some of them are so vivid. I've never been able to get away from them. Uh, and uh, about that? I mean, I don't want to... No, doesn't bother me anymore. Uh, probably one of the best therapies that I could have had was to have received the Medal of Honor. Because having received the Medal of Honor, I became a public figure. And I was such a shy, bashful, timid individual, really was. Uh, but I was forced to talk about it. I couldn't get away from it. And I don't blame the people at all. There was a curiosity there because it was uh, Fairmont, West Virginia had never had a Medal of Honor recipient before and most people had no idea what it was or how it came about or anything. So having to talk about it kept kept it, although vivid, it kept me from keeping it inside and just wrestling with it. Uh, there were some things that bothered me for 25 years. Uh, was the the fact that you had to take lives. Uh, I was raised, and most people are, you were, I'm sure, that uh, you don't kill. It's wrong. Anything, you, there's just no right way about it, you know. 
And uh, I think maybe our family was uh, maybe as strict or stricter than some of the others because we were never permitted to have weapons. We never BB guns or 22 rifles. Not in my family. We had one one gun. We had one 12 gauge shotgun, and the only reason we had that shotgun was uh, to hunt with, kill squirrels, groundhogs, you know, or to uh, we had sheep on the farm and uh, dogs got to chasing the sheep. Well, we'd kill the dog because the dog's going to kill the sheep, you know. But nobody ever handled that gun. You know, I mean, you just didn't take it out and shoot it for the fun of it. You, it always had a purpose. And we, we kids were told, don't touch that gun. No. So that bothered me for years and years and years. And finally, I reached a point where I felt that God forgave me, and then I forgave myself. But I had to do that. It, it took years. I just couldn't forgive myself. And that, that's the main thing I wrestled with for 25 years. But having to talk about it was probably the best therapy I could have had. Uh, I had one brother that was severely wounded in the Battle of the Bulge, died shortly after he got home, and he was the opposite. He wouldn't talk about it. I couldn't get him to talk about it. I, he wouldn't tell me anything. So, uh, which wasn't good for him, because all he did was wrestle with it himself, you know. So he wouldn't do it. Everybody heals differently. That's right, yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm not, again, I don't want to try to force you to talk about it, but what do you recall about those pillboxes and your taking them out? I mean, what, you obviously had to, like you said, talk about it, because the Medal of Honor recipients, there's a story behind each. Yeah. Each. Are you, are you okay with that? Well, there's two, two or three things that, that really stick in my mind and uh, keep, keep rolling around like a, like a movie. Was uh, the pillbox that I kept trying to get to, and uh, I'm crawling, and the Japanese are shooting at me with a what they called a Nambu, which is a machine gun. I think theirs were the 31 caliber, ours were the 30 caliber, but uh, we called them Nambus. They had a very unique noise when they fired. You could always identify them. Uh, but he was uh, shooting at me with that, and uh, I'm crawling up a ditch. Uh, they dug ditches between pillboxes so that they could come out of the pillbox, get in the ditch, and crawl to the next pillbox. Wouldn't have to stand up. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm trying to get to this pillbox. And... Uh, the bullets are ricocheting off of my flamethrower. Uh, and I can remember the, the hittings, the, the pings as it hit. And uh, fortunately, it was hitting the air tank between the flamethrower. And it was at a point where it ricocheted up. They hit the tank and ricocheted up rather than ricocheting down. And why I ever continued to crawl forward instead of going backwards, I've, I've never figured that out. Normally, I think the normal thing would be to do, if you're being hit like that, you'd want to crawl away from it. But no, for whatever reason, I crawled forward. And when I did, I got un in a position where he couldn't lower his machine gun low enough out of that little aperture to get to me. So I got that. You know, that's, that's when I released my flame, and was, once the flame goes through that aperture, they're done, because it's burning about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's just, you know. 
uh, one of the other occasions of trying to get to a pillbox, and uh, I don't remember particularly them shooting or getting close. I, I don't know. I can't remember why I changed my plan, but I saw smoke curling up out of a, the top of the pillbox, and uh, I decided I'm going to see. There's got to be an opening up there. Smoke's coming out, so I crawled up around, and they piled sand on this pill on these pillboxes to protect them from bombs and artillery, <coughs> and it was sloped in the back. So I crawled up that and uh, got up to where this pipe was, and it. Uh, was big enough so that my flamethrower nozzle just fit down in it and I just released the flame. And that's the one that I was told after we got back to Guam that had all of the, the 17 in it. I don't know. <clears throat> but the Japanese would put those individuals in pillboxes and then they would seal them so they couldn't get out. They had to stay there. Because they, they all knew they were going to die. Every one of them had been told, you are going to die here. There's no way you can get off this island. See? But they had no boats, no planes, no nothing. So they were going to die there. You know? And uh, one of the other occasions of trying to get to a, a pillbox, whether they ran out of ammo, I have no idea why, but I'm getting pretty close to the pillbox. And... Uh, they come out of the pillbox, and when I say there were several, I don't know whether several, what several means. Was that three or five or I don't know. I just see them, and they're charging at me with bayonets, rifles, bayonets. They they had bayonets on all the rifles, and so I I got them with. The, I just released flame, of course. The seeing that happen, uh, that's very vivid in my mind because once the flame died down, then they have crumbled and of course their clothes are on fire and, you know, but uh, those things have bothered me all these many years. But so much of it, I really have no memory of it at all. And I, I attribute that to fear. I really do. Uh, I had a psychologist tell me one time that if you make up your mind you are going to forget something, you can forget it. You can erase it from your mind. Maybe that's what I did. I don't know. Well, that's, um, that worked for you, you know, and, and here you are today. Yeah. Um, able to talk about it and, and, and deal with it. So I know you say you don't remember what you just told me, other than what you just told me, but would, is it accurate to say you were alone? I mean, you had those four guys, but two died in the process. Yeah. So not, not you, you, you had people around you, but you were you said you had to get within 20 yards, 20, 25 yards. Yeah. That was max. So you were probably closer than that, especially. Some of them I was. Especially the one where you were on top. Yeah. I mean, that's incredible. And it is. And and why they didn't get me, another one of those things that we'll never understand. Uh, I didn't get a scratch that day. No. Uh, the Lord was watching out for you, Woody. That, that's the only answer. That's, that, that's the only answer that I f have finally come up with. There is no other answer that I facetiously have said, uh, the Lord wasn't ready for me, and the devil didn't know what to do with me. <laughs> because <laughs> I didn't know the Lord at that time <clears throat> at all. I just knew there was a power. I, I recognized that there was a power, and that that power could save you. Now, I asked that power, whatever it was in my mind, to do that a number of times. But I didn't, I didn't actually know or recognize the fact that it was God. Because I, I was, 
brought up in a non-Christian home. We, we had a Bible, but nobody ever opened it except to record uh, births and deaths and marriages in it. That's the only thing that was in there, and nobody ever read it or anything of that nature. We didn't have a church in the community, so we never went to church. You know, so <clears throat> uh, I just knew there was a power. And stronger than I was, so Absolutely. many times I said, hip. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kenny wanted, Kenny suggested I ask you this, and, and um, I just just throw it out there to you. You've, you are a Medal of Honor recipient. There are, is it considered a brotherhood? for lack of a better word? I mean, do you find a lot of camaraderie oh, yes. in that group? Oh, yes. Talk about that a little bit, if you can. Well, one of the high, high pleasures, uh, I guess you would call it a pleasure, uh, but one of the highlights of my life was being selected to be the chaplain of the Medal of Honor Society. And uh, right now, today, we have 79 still living. But when I became chaplain 30, well, 40 years ago now, we had 250 recipients. I'm sorry, 79 from World War II or? Oh, no, total. Period. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. There are only 79 living today. And many of them are not able to participate in any way. Some of them are nursing homes, some assisted living, and uh, some can't get to conventions or meetings anymore because of health reasons. But uh, that was one of the highlights of my life, to be selected by them to be their chaplain. And uh, that gave me a, a, an inroad, if you will, of relationship with these guys that maybe I would have never had any other way. But it is a very close-knitted group of people. Not all of them participate. There are some that uh, will not and have not participated in the society at all. Uh, we have one guy that lives in Kentucky. Uh, at one time he came to our conventions and meetings and for whatever reason something happened and he doesn't he like to tell me what it was. He just won't do it. <clears throat> uh, but he hasn't been to a meeting since. So, uh, but we have others that have never participated at all. But they, there is a lot of camaraderie. When we have a convention, we're going to Boston in September. And uh, there'll be probably 45 to 50 of us there. And uh, there's a lot of, lot of closeness. Now, there, there are some who are, you just hang out together for whatever reason. You just, you know, you, you just take to each other. Others, you, you don't spend a whole lot of time with them, but they're part of your group. You know. What is it, do you think, draws you all together? I mean, obviously, you've all been you know, recognized for your for your yeah. deeds and valor, but to to have that closeness, it has to be more. I would think. It does. It, yeah, I I think if you could get everyone to say it, they'd say it in different ways. That they are here by the grace of God, by the, by the grace of something that they did not have any control over. Yeah, uh, not all of them practice uh, religion. Some of them don't participate. But one of the things they will do, and they won't fail, is to attend the memorial service for those that we have lost in the last year. See, we, we have a convention every year. And they will go to that, absolutely, because of that closeness of being a fellow recipient. Yeah. Gosh, I could I could talk to you for hours. I'm not going to do that to you. I told you I wouldn't. Um, but um, 
you you are you are well known. You are I kind of consider you an, an ambassador, not only for the the Medal of Honor, but for the state. I mean, you are you're a, you're a well known fellow. Hmm. I mean, what's uh? I'm gonna have to change batteries here. I do want to get this though. Let me get it. Get the rolling. There we go. Okay, I'll 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 try to rephrase it here so get you started again. Um, I've been to several. I've worked, you know, been to several things where you are. You know, you 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 are recognized. You are you are an ambassador for this state. Um, do you? And and you said you your upbringing. You were a shy, you know. Re, uh, introvert for lack yeah. of a better word yes and this is uh but you're certainly not anymore no does that no that that's got a why is that for you why why do you why do you do this why do you do what you do you could easily you know be be one of the people who got the received the medal of honor and chose not to talk about it maybe it's part of what you already said it, it it helped heal you to talk about it and and be out there in the front of of people but you you uh you represent it well that's what i'm what i'm getting to and it's it's it really is an honor for me to meet you it is but uh why do you do what you do you could you could you could you could, you could take it easy you could put on the brakes and I mean, how how old are you? Mommy you asking. I'll be ninety-two in October. You look fantastic for an <laughs> thank, you, thank you. I'm very fortunate. Absolutely, have been blessed. Yeah. Blessed beyond blessing. I don't do this for me. I never have. Uh, I'm not. I'm not the center of this thing at all. As an individual, I represent. other Marines that really never got to come home. And, and that was made pretty clear to me the day after I received the Medal of Honor. There were 11 of us received the medal, 11 Marines, and two Navy corpsmen on the same day, on October the 5th, 1945. And we were told uh, by our uh, sergeant escort, we had a Marine sergeant that kept us in line and where we were to be, when we were to be, and you know all that detail, that we uh, would go see the Commandant of the Marine Corps the next day. And uh, I've said, I don't know whether I was more frightened when I was standing in front of the President or when I had to go face the Commandant of the Marine Corps. I, if I were betting, I would say number two. Because the Commandant of the Marine Corps was, was just a, a person you never dreamed that you would ever encounter. And, but each one of us had to go see him individually, one at a time, in his office. And he was a recipient of the Medal of Honor himself from Guadalcanal. And now he's the Commandant of the Marine Corps. So <clears throat> when we went in and, and he told us to uh, stand at ease, and then he congratulated us, of course, and that sort of thing. And much of what he said I do not remember, and here again, I attribute it to fear. I was scared to death to be there. But one of the things that struck me was when he made the statement, that medal does not belong to you. And that rang a bell. And uh, then he continued to say, it belongs to all those Marines who never got to come home. And that stuck with me. So from that point on in my life, uh, 
any time that I wear the medal. I don't wear it for what I did. I wear it in their honor, and particularly in honor of those two individuals who gave their life, protecting mine. So there's no way I can ever repay what I have received. And my goal has always been to give credit to the others because all I was doing was the job for which I had been trained. And like many Medal of Honor recipients, if you ask them, do you think you did something special, they'll tell you no. I didn't do anything special. I did what I was supposed to do. And then others recognized that I did and were willing to testify as to what happened, which resulted eventually in my receiving the Medal of Honor. I get the feeling it's very humbling. It is. It is. But if those four Marines, well, if the captain hadn't been willing to make the recommendation and the four Marines who testified gave testimony as to what happened that day, uh, and Slager was one of those, but uh, if they hadn't been willing to do that, I would have never received the Medal of Honor. Because they didn't, they didn't come to me and they don't go to the Medal of Honor recipient and say, hey, what'd you do? <laughs> that wouldn't work, you know. And there are specific requirements that must be met before the person can receive the medal. And if you don't meet the requirements, you don't get it. There have been thousands of cases where the individual did something that would have resulted in his receiving the Medal of Honor had there been an officer survive who could recommend it and or witnesses who observed it. There were none left. Consequently, nothing happened. See? So uh, I just, there's no way I can repay, absolutely. And my whole goal has to been to an educational kind of thing, not just a, just for me, but for our youth. Uh, many of them have no concept of what others have done to make it possible for them to be a resident of a free a free country. They don't know, and maybe some of the things we say will register with them. Say, so, yeah, well, somebody did do something that made it possible for me to be here and do this. You know? So that's my whole goal. <clears throat> We're working on a project now, and uh, it's, it's ballooning and ballooning uh, to have a Gold Star Family Memorial Monument, at least one in every state, that recognizes the families who sacrificed a loved one so we could be free. If those individuals had never been willing to enter the armed forces to sacrifice their life, we would be a different world, sure. absolutely. And yet none of those families, you know, we've got what 11,000 names on our monument in Charleston on the Capitol grounds, none of those families have ever been recognized for the sacrifice that they made when they gave up a loved one for us. So the first one, of course, we did in the, the Donald Kennard Cemetery in October of 2013. The first one in the country, the first one in West Virginia. We now have six in five states. We have uh, about 18 different places in the country, uh, California, Kentucky, uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. <laughs> they are beginning to come into play so that those communities can recognize those who have made that sacrifice. And uh, it is such a rewarding thing to see a community recognize those people who have never had any credit 
or praise or recognition or anything else for their sacrifice. So it's a great program and it's going great guns. Is that what this is right here? I'm seeing this picture. I don't know what's in that picture. It's the Gold Star family. Yes, that's it. Okay. Yes, it is. Is is that up near? It's near the state police barracks. Yes, just yeah, in that in Donald C. Cunard Cemetery. Yeah. Well, that that 